Now, the other thing I wanted to tell you was, the first year that we did this, we had about a couple hundred people coming with a couple weeks left. But then we got this guy, Jenk, to debate Ann Coulter. So, so all of a sudden, we ended up getting about 3,000 people that first year. Then last year, last year, we got this guy, Ben Shapiro. So we ended up last year, last year we ended up with about 8,000 people coming to Politicon. So we thought this year, let's get these two guys together. They're both smart. They seem to have a bit of a following. And I think this year we have about 10,000 people at Politicon. So thank you for making this a big success. Your moderator, Ben and Cenk are backstage. They've got their gloves on. They're ready to go. Your moderator, Stephen Olakara, he's going to come out now. He's the president of the Millennial Action Project. Are you guys ready for this debate? Yeah. Let's do it. Stephen. Are you ready for debate night at Politicon 2017? All right. Well, let's bring them out, the people you've been waiting for. First, editor-in-chief of The Daily Wire and host of The Ben Shapiro Show, Ben Shapiro. of the Young Turks, Cenk Uger. If you guys could be a little more excited, that would be great. <laughs> All right, well, we're here to debate the future of the political parties. And let me just say quickly one thing about the format. I'm going to pose questions to both of our speakers here. We'll, we'll have a response. We can have a re-response. We can go back and forth a few times. When we've gone far enough, then I will step in. I might ask a follow-up question, or I might switch the topic. So, are we ready to go, guys? All right, well, let's start with one of the topics in the news today, and that's healthcare. And I'm gonna start with Ben. Are you proud or disappointed in establishment GOP figures like John McCain, Lisa Murkowski, and Susan Collins for their vote on healthcare? So, I'm wildly disappointed with the entire party. The fact is that we were promised a full repeal of Obamacare. They did not even attempt to pursue a full repeal of Obamacare. And the fact of the matter is that there's a significant gap inside the Republican Party about whether this should even happen or not. There are people who believe that the Obamacare regulations are an affirmative good. There was an attempt to basically leave all the Obamacare regulations in place and just remove the funding mechanism, which would have led to the exacerbation of the death spiral. The truth about healthcare is this. There are three qualities of healthcare that you can have. You can have affordability, you can have universality, uh, or you can have quality. And you can have two of those three things, but not all three. Right? You can have universality, affordability, or quality. Two of those three things you can have. And one of the things that's happened with Obamacare is that you've gotten closer to universality, but you haven't gotten any clo closer to either affordability or quality. And the Republican Party seems to be falling into the trap of basically just copying what the Democrats do, except being worse at it. What they actually need to do is relieve the regulatory burden that is driving up the cost of health care, and they need to stop acting as though insurance companies' jobs 
is actually just to reimburse people for their bad health. If you join up with an insurance company and your health sucks to begin with, you're going to pay more because it's an insurance company, not a charity. And that doesn't mean that we can't have... Now, that doesn't mean that we can't have some form of backup for people who have pre-existing conditions. I would hope that the social fabric would help fill that in. This is why I'm a big believer in charity and churches and synagogues filling that gap. But what we can't do is suggest, as the Bernie Sanders left does, that health care is an inalienable right, and therefore you can put a gun to my wife's head, she's a doctor, and you can force her to provide care at any cost you want to pay. You can't do that and hope to increase the supply of health care. Health insurance is not health care. They're not the same thing. And anybody who tells you differently is lying or trying to sell you something. Excellent. Cenk, your take on the health care vote. Great. Uh, before I do that, first of all, uh, welcome to the Thunderdome. <laughs> um, All right, all right, all right. Let's hear him speak. Guys, all guys right. wait till he does something. I mean, in, in all seriousness, in all seriousness, uh, the reason that, that I kid around about that is that I really want to make sure that uh, Ben's opinions are heard and my opinions are heard, and that this is an exchange of ideas. And believe it or not, there are some things that we do agree on, uh, and uh, what we won't be discussing those tonight. <laughs> so, um, so on the issue of health care, let, let's get going. So uh, the Democratic Party is incredibly proud that they defeated a bill that had 17% approval rating. It's a low bar. And I, I'm glad they held. Uh, the Republicans have a comical position, which is that why didn't the Democrats help us defeat Obamacare? Well, that's kind of because that was their idea. And why in God's green earth would they help you defeat their own plan? Now, is Obamacare enough? Not nearly. And uh, there are a number of issues that we had as progressives with it, including lack of price controls. Uh, you left it in the hands of private insurance, and of course, them being corporations, which Ben kind of alluded to there, uh, they're going to want to make money. And so that is very, very normal. And so I, I don't think that that was the right way to approach it, and it was originally a Heritage Foundation plan to begin with. Uh, so I believe that the right approach, and the one that Democrats should pursue next, although they probably won't, is Medicare for all. So, so real quick, let me explain why. Medicare uh, pulls a 77% and actually accomplishes the three things that Ben talked about. It's universal coverage, it is affordable, and actually gives you good insurance. That's why it pulls at 77%. And <laughs> Medicare for all now polling at 60%. Federally funded health insurance for everybody polling at 61%. So I tell to my Democratic friends, you might want to try something that's popular for a change. So, and finally, like, uh, on, the, on the idea that, um, hey, listen, everybody can't get health care. Well, this is not like furniture, which sometimes you allude to, Ben. Um, you look, you could have good furniture, bad furniture, I've had it all, right? That's optional. If you don't have good health care, you die. And, and so I view it as not something that capitalism should deal with, and I, and I believe in capitalism, and I think they make great sneakers. But something that, something that is about equality of opportunity. And you cannot have equality of opportunity if you're dead. So Medicare for all. Okay. Go ahead, so, go ahead. You know. All right, so a couple, of, a couple of notes in response to the Medicare for all shtick. So this is Bernie Sanders shtick, obviously. The problem with Medicare for all is that when people say that it's affordable, this is affordable to the person who has the Medicare. It is not affordable to the country. In fact, it is so unaffordable to the country that the state of California was a nut job leftist state, just refused to even pass Medicare for all because it would have immediately doubled the debt. As far as the idea that Medicare, that medical care is, is a right, but it's not actually a good or a service. This is a way to make things less plentiful. If you declare things right, but you don't actually incentivize the creation of those things, you don't get more of them. So the South African Constitution has right in there that health care is a right, that housing is a right. The fact is that you don't have good housing or health care in South Africa, because just declaring things right does not make them appear. What makes more things appear... 
is a market-based system that creates more doctors, that creates more medical care, that creates more incentive for people to join up. So my wife is a doctor. That means she has to go through a thousand years of medical training, and we have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to make her a doctor. The idea that you're going to have the government come in and then dictate the sort of care that she should provide to each particular patient and then dictate how much she should be paid for that care is going to lead to a decrease in the number of people who are going into the medical industry, which decreases the level of care overall. This is why I say that it is better to treat things as goods than as rights, because declaring something a right just means that you have the right to steal it from me. But declaring something a good means that you get a market process that leads to lower prices and better care over time. And the big problem we've had before Obamacare is that it was already treated quasi as a right. You had it heavily regulated on the state level. It is continually heavily regulated. The idea that a completely unregulated market is absolute nonsense. The reason that you have employer-based health insurance in the first place was as a response to wage and price controls placed in the aftermath of World War II, and employers began giving health insurance as an actual good, right? They gave it as an actual incentive to their employees. If you had an actual individual-based health insurance market, you bought it just like you bought your car insurance, you would see more and better health care for everyone. Yep. All right. So, Ben, I don't want to steal health insurance from you. I want you to be healthy. That's why I want Medicare for all. Um, you just want so, to take my money and my wife's services. So, you know, uh, Republicans frame taxes as stealing. That's preposterous. So if we don't have taxes, if we don't have taxes, well, we can't do all the things that we want to do as a community. Now, there are some things that we just talked about that we don't want to do as a community, we want to do as individuals. In fact, the things that we want to do as individuals uh, are much greater. That's why we're a mixed economy, but largely capitalist. And I agree with that. And I run a small business myself getting larger every day. So, <laughs> um, but there are some things that the uh, government should do. They should do the military, cops, roads, bridges, and yes, education and health care. Uh, that's because, you know, it, conservatives seem a little confused about how health care works. Paul Ryan had a whole um, press conference about this. Ben uh, a little bit alluded to it there. They're like, oh my God, it turns out the healthy subsidize the sick. Yeah, that's insurance. That's how it works. It's like the people with, uh, that are not getting into accidents are subsidizing the accidents. Yes, that's car insurance. That's how insurance works. And yes, taxes work in that we all decide we're going to do X, but we're not going to do Y. And I think it is fair for society to say that yes, we are going to do health care for everybody. Everybody. We're not going to leave 20 million people uninsured. We're not going to leave 30 million people uninsured. That's not what we do in a civilized society. And from time to time, they, you know, and they, they attack against Medicare. They say, oh, it's an entitlement. Yeah, we paid through, for it through payroll taxes our whole lives. You're goddamn right we're entitled to it. Because we paid for it. We paid for it. And so when you take out the middlemen of the insurance companies that put their profits in there, that put their marketing in there, that put their lobbyist money in there, that means more savings for Americans. And so finally, you know, the, the idea that it can't be done is preposterous since every other Western developed country does some version of single payer. It obviously can be done, and it is done at lower rates and better coverage. So let me add something to this question, and you can respond a bit if you want to, but Cenk referenced Paul Ryan. When the Republicans uh, took control of Congress, Paul Ryan, the Speaker of the House, famously said, we need to switch from being an opposition party to being a proposition party. So what's your evaluation, Ben? of their efforts in that direction to unite the party and move legislation forward. I mean, we all have eyes. They suck at it. I mean, <laughs> and Paul Ryan is not exactly my go-to guy when it comes to political acumen and genius. Uh, so I, I'd more want to respond to some of the contentions that Cenk was making about Medicare for all and single-payer health care. Uh, a couple of things. One, when you say we pay for it, that's not technically true. The idea that everybody who's paying into Medicaid paid for it and now they get out what they paid in is obviously not true. It is a redistributive program. And to pretend otherwise is just silly. The people who are paying the payroll taxes are not the people who are taking out through Medicaid. Obviously. Can I just address that super quick? So if we're, we're talking about Medicare, right? Not Medicaid. Right. So in Medicare, 
so you, you're both correct and incorrect. So it's not like I put in $20 and I get $20 back. That part is true. Right. But we all pay into Medicare together, and then we all get it when we, get, when we so are can sick, I ask a, that, so can which I ask is you insurance. A question? I have two questions, really, yeah. serious questions. One, what is your ideal tax rate? Because it's going to cost a lot of money for a lot of this stuff. And two, what is your ideal level of medical care? Because the fact is that we can spend millions of dollars on people at end of, in end-of-life care. We can spend millions of dollars on surgeries and preventative care. I mean, it's, healthcare is an expensive business, even under a single-payer system, which is why generally you end up with rationing. So what is your ideal level of health care that is provided to everyone, and what sort of tax rate are you proposing to subsidize that? Yeah, so those are very, very fair questions. So let's talk about taxes for a second. So conservatives uh, agree uh, or say all the time that the, uh, the golden era of America was the 1950s and 1960s. Well, there's a lot of truth to that. Our economy was booming at the time, and we became the number one economy in the world at that time. The tax rate for the highest uh, bracket uh, fluctuated between 70 and 91 percent. So that is when we were at our best. Now, I want to be clear. I'm also a businessman, and boy, that seems high. It does, okay? And, I, and one of the reasons my family were Republicans when, when I was growing up was because before Reagan came in, the highest marginal tax rate was 70 percent. So now we are nowhere near that. We, we have reduced taxes uh, to bare bones and we have shifted the taxes onto the middle class and away from the rich and corporations. So there is a much better balance to be had. And if you said to me, well, you're gonna have $800 uh, in taxes that are new, I say, wow, that hurts. But you're going to save $1,000 in premiums, deal. That is a deal I will take every time because I can do math. Okay. So. That is the beginning of your answer to, to taxes. And then you said, how much care? Well, so that is something that all the countries that do single payer or a version of single payer struggle with. And they have learned a lot of lessons. And if we stop saying, America's number one, we might actually just, first of all, on this issue, we're number 37. So, and, and if we looked at what Japan is doing so well, keeping costs down to half of ours and less, we might actually learn something from Japan, Switzerland, and the other countries. And by the way, when we say Medicare for all, Medicare Advantage exists, so you can actually add private insurance on top of that, and I find that perfectly great. I have no problems with that at all. So that is the government making sure you don't die and, and actually lowering rates for you, and then if you want more insurance, no problem. So all this sounds great, except for the fact that Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security eat up 66% of the federal budget every single year. The idea that all of these socialized medicine countries have it so much better than we do, particularly in terms of cancer care, is a joke. We are still number one in terms of five-year cancer survival rate here in the United States. And when you talk about top, top, uh, top marginal tax rates in the 1950s, there are a couple of things that are worth noting. One, that was top individual marginal tax rates, not necessarily the business tax rate. We now have some of the highest corporate tax rates altogether in the industrialized world. And if you would prefer for us to destroy half of the world before we become the only country that didn't have its industrial capacity destroyed, which is what happened in the 1940s, leading to us being the only productive country on planet Earth, essentially, for the next two decades, I'm not with you there. I'm not really in favor of having a giant world war that destroys all industrial capacity across the West, so we're the only people who actually have the capacity to produce anything and just markets that we can provide to. Right. So, first of all, uh, it is fair to say that, of course, the 1950s and 60s were different. we just come out of the war. So, uh, but uh, you have to consider all the different factors. So one was that factor, and the other factor that was the one I mentioned. So, so when uh, Republicans and conservatives say, well, high taxes, by definition, will lead to slower growth, well, we know because of our experience in the 1950s and 60s that isn't true. Now, you can say there are other factors, but you can't say that the highest marginal tax rate being 70 or even 90% slows down growth because it didn't. And it wasn't in Japan and Switzerland. It was right here. And, and so, and, and by the way, as a guy who grew up Republican, I was surprised by that too. I was surprised that Finland's system of non-competition in schools worked, but it does. So we have to be open to facts and, and understand. So, and, and on the issue of where we're good and not good in healthcare, sure, there are different areas where we excel. But Ben, honestly, you're cherry picking there at one particular area that we're good. Overall, we're number 37. That is not a good result. Well, you have so to if we're not dying means. from cancer, we're dying from other things. We're, it's empirical. We are, we are not as healthy. And finally, 
And finally, this idea that corporations are paying the highest tax rate is both, again, true and untrue. The part that it's true is, hey, it's, there's a rate of 35%. The part that's not true is they don't actually pay that. There is giant loopholes. And, and they've got $2 trillion sitting offshore, and they won't bring it in. And the reality is that if you look at the, the taxes from the 1950s, Corporations used to pay about a third of our taxes, about 33% of the taxes overall. So they did their fair share, and that is fair. I don't want them paying all of it, but I want them paying a, a reasonable amount. Now, the share that corporations pay of taxes is down to 10%. You see what they did there? They did wealth redistribution. They took your wealth and redistributed it to them. Okay. Let's Ben, I'll let you respond so that, to that. Yeah, one but, more, one yeah, more quick ahead. point, and then, and sure, then sure. I'll be done with this, because we can do healthcare for eight hours here. Yeah. Um, but two things. One, I'd like to know which tax deduction, when people say tax loopholes, a tax loophole is just a tax deduction that's available to everyone, and some people take advantage of it, and some people don't. I can't take advantage of certain corporate tax deductions, because my business isn't in those businesses, for example. I'm sort of with you in the sense that I'm not in favor of tax deductions. I'm in favor of a lower tax rate and get rid of a lot of the tax deductions, because I think that it's ridiculous that we have people gaming the system. That said, I'd like to know which tax deductions you'd like to do away with, and I'd like to know also when you say that corporations pay 10% of the taxes, right, and individuals pay the other 90%, okay, so that means the taxes are still getting paid to a higher rate than we ever have in our history in terms of the tax revenue to the government. The, the amount of tax revenue to the government right now is trillions of dollars every year. And final point here, you elided this question by saying we can learn stuff from Japan. The standard of care is the entire question when it comes to single-payer health care. That is the entire thing. If people felt like they were going to get the same access to care in a single-payer health care system as they did in a, in a system where they can pay their own way, then we would have no controversy here. But the fact is that rationing is mandated as soon as you start having the government run the health care system and decide what level of care people get. So I don't want anyone deciding what level of care that I can get. I don't want anyone else to They don't care about me. They don't know my child's name. They don't know my name. All they know is how much I cost. I mean, Ezekiel Emanuel is at least honest about this. Ezekiel Emanuel comes out and says, listen, I want to die at 70, right? I want to die at 80. That's fine with me. I'd rather die at that. Well, that's good for him. But if I don't want to die at 80 or I don't want my father to die at 80, it's none of his damn business. So, so when you say uh, tax revenue is at its highest point, now you know that that's misleading because everything economically is at its highest point, meaning that we have a lot more people in the country than we did in the 1950s and 60s, so hence we are collecting more overall taxes. But the reality is, a much as economy. a percentage, it is clearly down. It, it, the top bracket now is around 39%. It used to be at 91%. That's inarguable, right? But our economy is significantly larger than it was then, and part of that is because of reductions in taxes over previous decades. Well, we... <laughs> we, we, we tried supply-side economics. Hey, Kansas, how's that working out for you? So, there's this myth that... It's working uh, out for you. Your business is doing great. Okay, yeah. <laughs> well, we just had eight years of Obama. <laughs> So, so the tax rate is clearly lower for the richest people in the country. It is clearly lower for corporations, in effect. It is, uh, and so to say that it's a, a record collection is misleading. So in terms of the um, health care and how that relates to uh, the government, you, oh, by the way, on one more thing on taxes, you said, name me a tax loophole. Mm -hmm. So yes, there, there are plenty of those. For example, they uh, hide their money offshore. They do tricks like the double dutch and the Irish sandwich or the reverse. And, um, and I would end that. I would say, hey, you know what? We've got a 35% rate. Here's the new rule. You're going to pay 35%, okay? And you're not allowed to hide your money. I don't care if it's in the Cayman Islands. We're going to make that illegal, Mitt Romney. We're going to make it illegal, okay? And so then every once in a while, they do a tax holiday. Well, that must be nice. You remember when you got a tax holiday? I don't remember getting a tax holiday. No, that's only for corporations who bribe politicians. So they brought that rate down from 35% to 5%. And they said they were going to create more jobs. Color me surprised when it turns out they didn't. They offshore taxes. They took that 30% extra, put it in their pocket, gave it to their executives, and created no new jobs. Because that's how it works if you just trust corporations to do the right thing. 
Corporations are not evil. They just want to maximize profit. That is what they're built for. So please don't be naive and be like, no, but the corporations will look out for our interests. No, they look out for their bottom line. Well, I mean, and finally, is... just last quick thing, sure. Medicare Advantage. You keep saying rationing health care, but Medicare gives you the bare minimum, and, and people seem to be very, very happy about it given how well it polls, but you can do Medicare Advantage and get more. I want you to be able to do that. If you're incredibly rich and you want every kind of treatment, I don't want to deny that to you. Get Medicare Advantage. So yes. Ben, let me just ask the if problem you can is when respond you pay, to that too. Is the problem is when you pay a higher tax rate throughout the course of your life to pay for all of the Medicare that you are talking about, you don't have enough money to pay for Medicare Advantage in many cases. And as far as this idea that you know, corporations, have, they don't have any of your interests at heart. You are a corporation. TYT is a corporation. You have 80 employees. I assume that you're not just a greedy asshole and that you actually would like to help your, your employees from time to time. And you just talked about how under Obama, everything got better with your business. Well, under Obama, he didn't radically escalate taxes. Okay, there was not a radical escalation of taxes under President Obama. And finally, when you, you seem to be identifying a higher tax rate in the 1950s with higher level of growth. So if that's the case, why not just tax everybody at 100% and we can have massive growth from here to eternity? Because well, let me just ask, since we're talking about taxes, do you think we'll see tax reform in the, in the next few months here? Okay, so let me try to address all that in your, in your question as well. So just real quick, look guys, I, I said it however many questions ago, of course you have to have, find the right balance on all of these issues, including taxes. So I never said uh, there's no end to how much you can I'm, I'm just asking pay. why though. Yeah, so, so the, the, this leads to, no wait a minute, this leads to big government versus small government. I'm telling you, are asking me what the ideal tax rate is, and then you did a straw man there for a second and said it should be 100%. I never said that. No. I In mean, fact, I said. No, you said you said the economy. Let me let me understand. Economy, what you, said. You, you said the economy grew faster when the top marginal tax rate was 91%. So I'm asking you, why shouldn't the top tax rate or all tax rates be 91%? You seem to be identifying a higher rate of growth with higher taxation. So I'm asking you yeah. on principle. You okay, keep talking now, about the glories of a mixed economy. So now tell me about the glories of capital. I've heard about the glories of high tax rates. I've heard about the glories of government provided health care. Now tell me some of the glories of, of actual capitalism, which is the basis for all the things you're talking. Tell me why it's good. Right. So now, look, when, 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 when you, s I use the example of the 91% and the 70% to give you a sense of that I was surprised and you'd be surprised to find out that our economy was booming in those times. That's not to say that that is the right tax rate for us today. And so the exercise of finding the right tax rate is, guys, try to follow along, okay? It's called logic. So, it would be preposterous to set the tax rate at zero. It would be preposterous to set it at 100%. So what we have to do as a society is figure out where we can maximize the most amount of good for, for the country. Be closer to zero or closer to the government, to But not too much away from us. So, for example, the reason why when taxes are higher, it winds up being better for the economy is because it recirculates the money. So if you give it to the rich, this is hilarious. If you're uneducated, please at least don't, <laughs> don't make it obvious. This is the most interesting conversation so on taxes if, if I've heard. if you don't know the concept of recirculation of money, then go look it up. And so the way that it works is that when the middle class, when the middle class has more money, disposable income, they spend it. Why? Because they're not living in the lap of luxury. They're not saving it for their yacht. So they need to buy food for their family. They need education for their family. So they spend it and it goes back into the economy. If you just give it in supply side economics to the rich and hope that it trickles down on us eventually decades later, what they wind up doing it, with it is something that is logical. They save it. But that means it does not recirculate in the economy. And that is why when you have lower taxes, ironically, the economy does worse. But of course, it's a balancing act. Okay, so uh, th now you're making a strong case for Keynesian economics, which is totally fine, obviously. Uh, the, the problem with Keynesian economics is that it doesn't even work in theory because, again, once you go to the logical extreme, which is remove all of the money from the rich people who are saving all their money and give it to all the poor people to buy hamburgers, that doesn't help the economy or spur the economy. What spurs the economy is a higher level... What? 
What spurs the economy is the creation of new products and services, and that is only going to be done by people who have exp expendable capital to actually invest in the new products and services that we all enjoy. This is what creates economic growth. Sa it's also worth noting that this, this myth that spending is inherently better for an economy than saving, that's only true if you're talking about somebody who's actually taking the cash and just shoving it into their mattress. Banks are in the business of lending. When they take the money in, they don't just stick it in Al Gore's fake lockbox. They actually lend the money back out to people to actually create new businesses and new products. You had an investor, right? When you started TYT, you were given $4 million by Buddy Romer to start TYT. That's great. That's the way business should work, right? But that money had, it didn't come from a bunch of poor people buying hamburgers. It came from a very, very wealthy guy who gave you money to create a business a lot of people want to patronize. If you want better products and better services, you need more investment in the products and services. The basic name, trickle-down economics. The basic name trickle-down economics is not something that any conservative even proposed. It's a leftist revision of what economics actually is because you're not giving me the money. It was my money in the first place, created through voluntary transactions that I had with others. I've not stolen money from, either, from anyone, neither have you. And the idea that money has to be forcibly taken from you and handed to somebody at the bottom end of the economic spectrum to somehow jog the economy, that may jog McDonald's, but is not going to jog all of the creation of the products and services that make all of our lives much better today than they were 30 years ago in terms of the stuff we have access to. Shrink, I'll let you respond to that briefly and then we'll switch topic. Yeah. So I'll try to answer that as briefly as I can, and I'll go on to your questions. So uh, when, when, you, when you talk about, hey, the banks, are, they're, they're not going to just keep the money. They're going to put it out and, and lend it to people, unless they decided they, to do their own investments, which is what they did because we repealed Glass-Steagall. So it's not as simple as, oh, I have money, so then I will now utilize it or I'll uh, lend it out. So that is way oversimplistic. Speaking of oversimplistic, to say that, oh, well, they'll go buy hamburgers with it, Come on. You were going to so food. the middle class is struggling right now. And we've turned this into a Walmart economy where people are getting $7.25. And that, that if you're getting around $10, I think that's about 15000 a year. So don't, like, that is serious pain and difficulties. So if you give those people money, it's not like, ah, oh, I just want to go get a hamburger. No, they, no, have to they eat. desperately need that money. And they, yes, they will spend it all in, in, back into the economy. So that's an economic fact. And so. And, and Ben, for the 88th time, we have to find a balance where you have provided an incentive for people to save and invest, and you have provided an incentive for people uh, uh, to be able to put money back into the economy and to be able to live. And it's not, and taxes is not stealing from you. So you're right, I run a business. So in order for people, my employees, to get to my company, you know what they have to do? They have to drive on roads. Okay, so it's not stealing from me to build that road. That helps my business. They had to go to school. The, the fact that they went to public schools allows them to work for me. All these things are things that I benefit from. I didn't build that company by myself. Every single person that works there helped me to build that company. And that's what it means to work together. Okay. So, And so, to, to answer Steve's question finally, look, it, it, you know, what, what, what is this Congress going to do on, on tax reform? Uh, and Ben and I disagree on this, too, because we, we just talked about it a second ago. Um, and this is just political prognostication, but I, I, I think that the Republicans will definitely pass tax reform. And, I, and the reason I say that is because the Republican Party at this point is completely dependent on their donors. And by the way, don't get me wrong, the Democratic Party is also largely dependent on their donors. I think the Republicans are a tiny bit more corrupt. But uh, so I think that... I think, I think that uh, their donors are going to demand those tax cuts. And if I am right, and we'll all see this, you know, because it's something that's going to happen later, not something that has happened, they will do everything. They will move mountains to make sure that those rich donors and corporations will get their tax cuts. Okay. So this is... This is an interesting case where uh, I say to Chank's prognostication from his mouth to God's ears, and he says about mine from my mouth to God's yeah. ears, because I don't think they're going to pass anything, <laughs> uh, because I think that there's a, a high-level incompetence inside the Republican caucus, and, and it's pretty fractious. Um, but uh, I, I do want to go back to a couple of points, because you actually hit on some major thematic points. 
you talked about roads and the fact that we need roads in order to get to work. This is a point Elizabeth Warren made and obviously a point that President Obama made at the time. I don't think anyone argues that we don't need roads to get to work. The problem is that when you're talking about roads as a percentage of the budget, we are talking about a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of the federal budget and of the state budget and even of the local budget. So the idea that you're justifying massive tax rates on corporations or to pay for roads is just intellectually dishonest. It's a tiny, per the stuff that we agree on, the government should spend on, is a tiny percentage of spending, right? It's all the other stuff that we disagree on. As far as the idea that I'm somehow being, you know, uh, dismissive toward people who are buying hamburgers, I'm not. I'm saying the people who are poor need to buy hamburgers to feed their children. They don't have the money to invest in building an iPhone because when you're just trying to get by and you are living in a Walmart subsistence economy, you're using that money to buy the products and services you need to get by. That does not create new products and services that become cheaper over time through competition. You need somebody to make those investments. You, you said this about Glass-Steagall, for example. You said the banks, they might make their own investments. In what? In what? They're not investing in themselves. I mean, they have to take that money and then they have to use it to invest in something else. Places like Apple, places, some that fail and some that succeed. This idea that banks are somehow evils is just not the case unless you are talking about them working in Congress, here you and I agree, working in congruity with a Congress and with a legislature that is attempting to give them kickbacks. Both you and I agree on this. So, and finally, as far as the idea that Republicans pass tax cuts because they're beholden to their donors, okay, and Democrats pass tax increases because the unions give them hundreds of millions of dollars every year, and I don't see Democrats complain about this. Um, so, you got me there. The unions give money to the Democrats. Um, so, am I, am Are I you gonna, angry about am, that? I mean, does it upset you as much as, you know, bankers giving money to Republicans? No, no. Co the corporations give way more than the unions. Um, so, It depends on which corporations. That's, okay. That's not That's really okay. true. That's okay. Look it up. You can Google it. It's really easy. Um, so, do I object to taking out union money from politics? Hell no, I don't object. Take it all out. Take the union money out. Take the corporate go uh, money out. Take all the big money out. They're supposed to represent us and not the donors, no matter who the donors are. So in terms of the question that you asked, Glass-Steagall, well, aren't they investing in things? No. Uh, I have a literal answer for you. Oftentimes what they do is financial derivatives. In fact, that's the majority of what they do. And financial derivatives is simply gambling. That's what crashed the 2008 economy. And, and what is so damaging about the removal of Glass-Steagall is now they could do their financial derivative gambling with depositor money. Boy, isn't that nice. They take your money and they gamble with it. And if they lose, well, that's a sad day for you. But if they win, they keep the profits. You know what that is? That's privatizing the gains and socializing the losses. So. It's not, it's not that the banks are evil. Of course they're not evil. It's just that they're driven to make more money. Of course, that is the whole point of maximizing profit. So if we say, hey, banks, you're allowed to go and buy politicians, although the Supreme Court would say, no, they're just talking to them. They just gave them billions of dollars. They're just having a conversation, right? Just because they gave them billions of dollars, they don't, do they want something in return? Of course they want something in return. And that's our money. So what they got, it, it, they, what they got was laws passed by politicians to remove Glass-Steagall. And yes, Clinton and Gingrich, yes, both parties are guilty on that. But now the Democrats want to put it back and the Republicans don't. And they, they took our depositor money and they gambled with it. And if you thought they, if you gambled, you get to keep all the profits, and if you lost, it didn't affect you at all, you would probably gamble a lot of money too. And you would take a lot of risk until you crash the economy, and that's exactly what happened. Okay, so, so, uh, so ben, let me just add one piece to this question, you'll respond to it too. You've talked a lot about the corruption in politics, mm -hmm. and a core part of the Trump campaign was railing against the establishment, which he thought was corrupted, and a lot of the big donors were initially against him. So which way is the Republican Party going to go on this? Is it Trumpism and the grassroots movement or the establishment? Well, I mean, I, when it comes to money and politics, I think that, that that breakdown doesn't really hold. I mean, the fact is that, that President Trump during the campaign talked routinely about how he engaged in, in putting money into politics. So, I mean, this is a game that a lot of people are playing. It's, it's kind of a weird question. But uh, as far as the idea that all money should be out of politics, here's the problem. Okay, TYT, I, we both have corporations and we expound upon politics every single day. And we motivate thousands of people, right, every day on both sides of the aisle. 
That is effectively an in-kind contribution. Now, I, you campaigned with Bernie Sanders. Did you do it because you expected, that's fine. Did you expect, did you do that because you supported Bernie Sanders or did you do that because you expected some gimme for TYT in return? I no. assume you did it because you supported Bernie Sanders, right? Yes. So, yes, okay. So, the point that I am making is to attribute to everyone else bad intent when it comes to political spending and politics, but to yourself, it's totally fine. And when it comes to other media entities that give in-kind contributions on a regular basis through their coverage, this is, when the New York Times, when the New York Times, which is biased to the left, spends an inordinate amount of time and money reporting on Mitt Romney's idiotic stories about how he was in high school and cutting a gay kid's hair in 1932, if you're saying to me that that is less impactful on the political sphere than a corporation, which is a group giving money to a, to a political candidate for purposes of supporting that candidate, I fail to see how you can say for yourself that you are innocent in this, but everyone else is guilty. I don't believe that. Either everyone's guilty or everyone is innocent, or if you can find the actual cases of guilt where there's a quid pro quo, then we agree. That's prosecutable, right? Yes. So. Fine, uh, other point, when you talked about the 2008 economy, you talked about Glass-Steagall and how this led to the crash. The real reason that the crash happened had far less to do with Glass-Steagall. I opposed the bailouts, by the way. It had far less to do with Glass-Steagall than it had to do with the fact that the federal government was actively promulgating the notion that corporations should give subprime mortgages to people who are not qualified as, as people who could take out loans. This meant that, as you say, Corporations are not inherently conservative, they're not inherently free market, they're inherently profit driven. So if they felt that they could give a bunch of subprime mortgages and this would inflate the real estate prices and if things went wrong, they just foreclose on the nearest house and the market just keeps going up and up and up and they can just, as you say, turn these into derivatives and sell them on the open market by pretending that these are all good loans because they have government backing, then of course you're going to get an inflated, overheated real estate market. But the question there is not the workings of the free market, it's the, com it's the combination that you like in a mixed economy, that I hate. Okay, I hate mixed economies in the sense that I don't believe that capitalism and socialism should be mixed, that corporatism is the solution. Okay, what you're talking about is corporatism. You're talking about Glass-Steagall, which, which free the, the, the getting rid of Glass-Steagall, it freed the corporations to invest in a free market manner, but also they gave a bailout to all of these corporations by essentially incentivizing them to give a bunch of bad loans, knowing that if things went bad, then all the losses would be socialized. The problem there is not the free market. The problem there is a government that is acting as a backstop for bad decisions in the free market by profit-driven corporations. Okay. All right, I love that. There was a lot to respond to there, so let me try to take it one at a time. Um, so first off, I love the idea that uh, the government made the banks do the subprime mortgages, and golly gee, the government twists the banks are when well, they, they made billions them upon billions of dollars. Oh man, oh don't make me make another billion. Don't make me make another billion. No, they did those, uh, if they thought they were gonna lose money off of it, they would have a fiduciary responsibility not to do it. I agree. Okay, it, it was, they were not forced to make billions of dollars. They were not forced to then have us bail them out. Right. They did all of that because there's legalized bribery in America. Right, because okay. the government was giving them money, So, Correct. So now let me address that. You say, well, what's the difference between uh, your speech and their speech? Mine is actually speech and theirs is money. <laughs> so there's a giant difference. But you spend money on so, your speech. So first off, so they say, uh, no, no, Supreme Court uh, says, no, money is speech now. No, money is property. It's not speech. And so if, if money was speech, well, then if you go to a hooker and you say, oh, no, uh, officer, I was just talking to her. Okay. <laughs> money is not speech. So, for example, to give you a sense of it, to compare me saying I like Bernie Sanders and you saying whoever you like is the equivalent of this is obviously nonsensical. I believe it's obvious. So... In a five year, recent five year period, uh, the top 200 corporate givers, uh, they both in donations and in lobbying spent $5.8 billion, okay? So that is not the same thing as me saying, hey, I like what Bernie's saying about college and Medicare. And, and when they did, why do you think they did? It was not because, hey, they genuinely like Bernie or Trump or Hillary. Because in return for that $5.8 billion, they got $4.4 trillion in government subsidies. So, which leads, which leads to, I actually think, the biggest point here, the difference between big government and small government. So, a, a lot of times conservatives say, oh, you guys like big government. That's not true. So, let me explain. We, if I ask you, hey, you got a plumbing job, what would you like, big pipes or small pipes? I don't know. What's the job we have? It depends. 
It's the same thing with the government. Okay, what size government would you like? I don't know. What's the job we have? So to say big government or small government doesn't make any sense. So, for example, do I want a big government that invades Iraq? Hell no, I don't. No way. And, and Ben, you were vociferously for the Iraq war. So in that sense, you love the big government. Couldn't get enough of it. And I could go on and on and on. Republicans say, no, 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 we don't like big government, but we'd like to be inside your uterus. So just admit it. It's no problem. Just say it. Say I love big government. It's okay. So you're talking about when you like tax when when you're rich and you want tax cuz oh no, I don't want big government. I want small government. But when it's convenient for you and you'd like oil subsidies and you'd like wars and you'd like to meddle in people's private lives, then you love big government. Okay, you want so, to, the, I need to respond to some of that. Yeah, so, yeah definitely. The, okay, so first of all, I'd like to point out that Cheng's big government, small government dichotomy was proposed by you, not by me. I talk about the proper scope of the government's involvement in particular areas the same way that you do, and we may disagree on all of that. My point is that overall, if you're talking about the level of government spending, it needs to go down, and you believe that it really needs to go up. Okay, so it's disingenuous. It depends. It's, it's, not it's, on war, it doesn't. No, but I, overall. Not on over, the war okay. on drugs. Cheng, not on Cheng. so many over, of those wasteful overall, programs. It overall, it depends. But let me, overall, let, you want you the finish. federal budget increased. Overall, I would like the federal budget decreased. To pretend that this is not true is to lie. Okay, and when you suggest that there is no difference between, you know, we just have different visions of, of what the government should cover, these things cost different things. Okay, the war in Iraq was very expensive. You know what's more expensive? Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. All of these are vastly more expensive than the war in Iraq we paid and Afghanistan. Into it. Now, as far as this, again, going back to this idea, going back to this idea that, again, I don't like this big government dichotomy any more than you do in the sense that you say, well, it's big government for the government to get inside people's wombs. And I say that it is the government's job to preserve life, liberty, and property, and one of those things is life. To protect you, to protect you from someone else taking it, okay? To protect you from someone else taking it. Now, when it comes to the idea that all money in politics is bad, again, I ask you, final, final question, you know, final point on, we're going through 10 points at a time here, but final point here. When you say money in politics is bad, again, I ask you, Buddy Romer gave you $4 million to start TYT. What did he expect in return? Should he not have given you money? Was the money not speech? It was just money, after all. It's just like a hooker, I assume. So are you the prostitute? How did this work? When you take money from Al Jazeera, okay. does that make you a hooker so for the Qataris? How does awesome, that work? Can I, that was an awesome conflation. Okay, we were talking about money in politics and how money is not speech when you give it as a campaign donation, and you turn it around to a business investment. You know, in a business investment, it has nothing to do with speech. Money is money. They give us an investment, so because they believed in our business. Good. That and has nothing to do with politics. That's great. And you think the government is in the business of regulating so, business. So, so if the government is in the business of regulating business, what would be the problem with the government telling Buddy Romer he is not allowed to invest in your business? No, that has, no, no, those are two different issues. No problem, no problem. No, it's, it's, one thing is to say, hey, let's set reasonable limitations on what can happen around elections, which is, again, what most developed Western countries do. So, and they have different versions of that rule. There's uh, ads you, can run, uh, you can't run ads within a certain period of time. You have public financing versus private financing. Those are rules around an election. That is a completely different issue than the government saying randomly you can and you can't invest in businesses. Why? So you're conflating those two issues that have nothing to do with one another. Why? So let, let, let's just uh, we're, Wait, we're, what does we're, why mean? Because it's those a, are two, because, hey, it, why, hey, you because, know, you believe in education, quick, so why quick, don't you quick. believe in health care? Because, because it's a free country and I get to spend my money wherever I damn well please. Right. So as we're coming to the close here, we're going to do one okay, more. I got to ask him. I got to ask him. All right, very quick. So very you, quick, you damn though. well please. Okay, so when the Koch brothers or Bloomberg or Soros puts in hundreds of millions of dollars into elections, you think, well, I just do it because they're good guys, and they want, and they just, they, they damn well please buying all those politicians. Or you think, no, the politicians would never be affected by hundreds of millions of dollars in legalized bribes. 
Okay. And you can't just spend your money anywhere you want. Of course there are rules. You can't bribe people. Right. There's many things you can't do with your money. And one of those should be bribing politicians, but we made it legal. Chank. So I'm curious what your opinion on that is. So, okay, do you so, think that they're just golly shucks? So, uh, Chank, they just mean well? And Chank, you're a lawyer, so you know that bribery requires two parties to the bribe. If I give money to a politician, there must be something in return. If there is no quid pro quo, there is no bribery. You think there's nothing in return? Well, you, have you think the politicians don't no, do those I think, favors? I think, no, I think very often there is something in return. But I want you to point me to the things that are in return, not just say that all spending on politics ought to be forbidden except for the Young Turks. No, that is of course not what we say. If, 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 you, if you want to get money out of politics and then you said the Young Turks cannot donate money to politicians, I'd say, of course, that's the whole point of getting money out of politics. Wait, so, so, okay. so, 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 Chang. so this idea that, you, Chang, well, hey, on. what? Come on. It's so disingenuous. If, even if you're a Republican and you're a conservative, you think there isn't crony okay. capitalism? You think that that $4.4 trillion okay, that went in subsidies final, final isn't question. because they got campaign donations? You know it's because Chang. they got campaign Fin donations. Chang. Chang. Okay, final question. This is going to be the last word final on this. Final thing here last on this, word. okay? Final question on this. So, Young Turks is super successful. We have 80 million uniques. It's, it's wonderful. Do you think Thank Bernie you. Sanders would care more if you gave him $10,000 or if you dedicated your entire network to kissing his ass for an election cycle? <laughs> All right. So, two things about this. First of all, I think you and I will agree, I think you and I will agree uh, that what we did in praising some of Bernie's programs, a lot of Bernie's programs, but not all, for example, I disagree with him on guns, and I thought Hillary's education program was slightly better than Bernie's. And, and by the way, I agree with the Republicans on the Export-Import Bank, so it's not blind allegiance. That is not what we do, not remotely, okay? Second of all, I think you'll agree with me that the mainstream media kissing Hillary Clinton's ass for two straight years was a much bigger problem. Would you outline? Now, the distinction that you're asking for, the Would distinction you that, that you're asking for, and now I've answered I think four times is, one is speech, and, and by the way, protected, you, you said life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. I think we all agree to that. I got a big applause line. I also agree. And in our, in our Constitution, the First Amendment is right to speech and freedom of the press. So that is that rubric. Money is not in the First Amendment. There is no right to spend money on politicians. Money is money, speech is speech. All right, so let's do rapid fire now as we come to the close here. I think, by the way, there's wide agreement about the corruption in politics, maybe different ways of how to deal with it, but this has been a very good conversation. So I'll go first to Ben. As we look at 2020, what will be a winning message and who will be a winning candidate on the Republican side in 2020? So, I think, that, I think that the greatest ally that the Republicans have is the incompetence and stupidity of the Democratic Party. Uh, the, the, the 2016, in fact, I have a feeling that Cenk actually might agree with me on this, that 2016 election, Donald Trump became President of the United States. Right? Hillary Clinton was the worst candidate in the history of mankind. And that had, so, you know, the, the Republican message I never thought was a particularly losing message. I just think that what we have right now is such a polarized politics that it's going to be very difficult for anybody to pass anything in this climate. I also think that what, what we have almost a, a reactionary feel on both sides. Like, what I like about this debate is that we're actually talking about ideas, which is actually pretty rare in this, in this, in this sphere. Well, what's become more common is that on the left, there's this, there's this retreat to intersectionality as an identity politics. This idea that if we can cobble together a group of people who are feeling victimized by American society, you know, we have black people and we have Hispanic people and we have women and we have gays and lesbians and transgenders, and they all feel really bad about how American politics is going, and if we push that notion, we can create a coalition, there'll be a brand new coalition never before seen in American politics, and that requires a woman to run, or that requires a black woman to run, or that requires a minority to run. If they do that, then what you're going to see from, in, I think, an equally nasty way from the right is a response that says, okay, well, if you're going to do identity politics, you will see some white identity politics from the right, which I think is really negative. I don't want to see either of those things. What I would like to see is the Democrats' campaign on the bigger, uh, on, the, on the stronger involvement of government in your life and higher taxes program that Chank wants them to campaign on. 
the Bernie Sanders Elizabeth Warren program, and I would like to see the Republicans campaign on my program, a smaller government libertarian program that says the government should get as out of our lives as much as humanly possible. All right, and for Cenk. For Cenk, what will be a winning message and who will be a winning candidate for Democrats in 2020? Yep. So, uh, I... <laughs> um, Wouldn't so, it be weird if this ended up being the stage? <laughs> yeah, that's what I told yes, you guys backstage. This is a presidential debate. Uh, okay, so, look, Ben, you said earlier that you didn't set up the big government, small government paradigm, but you just said you want them to run on a small government uh, yes. platform. A less involvement so, in what, American Again, lives, yes. small government doesn't make any sense. So let's, let's break it down. You, you asked me about... Well, about particular issues, so I'll give you one. So you were in favor of the Iraq war, uh, that cost us at least one and a half trillion dollars. Then people turn around and say to Bernie Sanders, well, I mean, college uh, for your kids, your kids are middle class, uh, that's unaffordable. That's way too much money, you can't do that. That costs $75 billion a year. First of all, college for your kids, you know what that's called? That's called the American dream. And for, and for one Iraq war, for the cost of one Iraq war, we could have gotten 20 years of free college for all those kids and the American dream. So it isn't about big government or small government, it's about what do we do with the money. So that $1.5 trillion could have gone to us, could have gone to the middle class, could have gone to a better economy. Because when you go to college, you come out, you start businesses, you engage in, in this market, and you make things better, and you employ people. We could have used that for us. Instead, we wasted it in Iraq. And, by the way, you, I believe, Ben, you, you want to get tough on Iran, you want to you know, rip up the deal, etc. If you thought the Iraq war was a waste of blood and treasure, wait till you get a load of what happens in Iran. So we're not going to make that mistake again. We're not going to make that mistake again. So what would I want to, look, this idea of the identity, that Democrats are on identity politics, and some of them do. But let's not forget that Republicans do the same and worse. Who was the one who came up with the Southern strategy? That was the Republican Party. And the Southern strategy was, let's go get racist white voters in the South. That's a fact. So, once again, it's this wonderful capitalist invention called Google. Google it. So, two, two Republican chairmen have said, yes, we did do that strategy, and we apologize. So that's a fact. They're the ones who invented identity politics. So, when you, you like identity politics when it serves your interests, but all of a sudden, when we say, hey, can black people have the same rights as white people? Oh, identity politics. Can gay people have the same rights as straight people? Identity politics. It's called equality. Look into it. It's called America. OK? All right, well, I think we now okay. know. USA, USA, USA. All right. Equality for all of us. OK. All right. I want to respond this to this is this is a point just very quickly in the last round. Very quick, okay. okay? Very quick. Okay, I want to respond to a point. This is a point that Chenk made last year in his debate with Dinesh repeatedly for about an hour. Uh, was the Southern strategy with regard to the Republicans. Okay, I'd like to point out the idea that the entire South solidly moved into the Republican category because of the Civil Rights Act is historically false and has been debunked multiple times by people ranging from Sean Trent to Real Clear Politics to professors at the University of Pennsylvania. And there's a bunch of ways to debunk it, including the fact that the Congress did not switch Republican in the South until 1994. Okay, did it take 30 years for the racists to realize what was going on? 21 senators from the South were Democrats. How many of them became Republicans after the Civil Rights Act? The answer, one. The other 20 stayed Democrats. In 1952, Eisenhower did not win a ton of the South. Eisenhower did win, however, seven states in the South in 1956, after he sent federal troops down South. The reason that the, that the Republican Party started to win in the South, it began in the 1950s, not after the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and it was largely due to the movement of industry down South. It was new fringe members of the Republican Party, younger members of the Republican Party, who switched over to the Republican Party in the South, not old Democrats, who remained old Democrats and are still old Democrats today. Right. So I'm going to jump in here. Okay, I, I got it. Real quick, 
You're right. Very quick. By the way, yeah, yeah. By the way, yeah. Yeah. Jimmy, Car yeah. Jimmy Carter yeah. launched his 1980 campaign at the headquarters, that town in Alabama that was the headquarters for the KKK. So to pretend that it was only yeah. Republicans playing yeah. the bad and evil right. race strategy is just so, a lie. All right. Okay. Last word. So that was him responding to his own thing. Okay. So, uh, real quick, because you're right, we had a whole hour long, almost an hour long debate on this other strategy. Uh, you always get, you guys always pick, cherry pick certain windows of time. In this very narrow window of time, this people came to that people. I just went from 1952 okay, to 1994. If, if, hold on, hold on. If, if Ben, if you're so right, why did two uh, heads of the RNC come out and say, yes, we did the Southern strategy, and we apologize? Why did Pat Buchanan say to me on MSNBC, yes, we did the Southern strategy, yes, we got whites to vote for us in the South, and we had a good run? Okay, it wasn't me saying it, it was Republican leaders, and, and Buchanan, yes. who did it at the Nixon campaign, admitting that that was exactly the strategy. And there were some members of the Republican Strategy Council who were doing evil things. That doesn't mean all the people who voted for the Republicans were voting for right. them because of those things. And to impute that motive to tens of millions of people down south is to ignore not only every public I'm opinion I'm imputing it to on, Republican I'm leaders. Also to fail to, to recognize right history. Here. All right, I'm going to cut right in here. <laughs> so, first of all, I think we figured out who this crowd wants to run for president in 2020. Ben Shapiro. Thank you, Uger. Second of all, this is exactly the type of debates we need to be having from between the left and the right all across the country. And I want to thank Politicon. I want to thank Politicon because what, this is exactly what we need in America. If we're not listening to each other, then our democracy won't succeed. And that's why I think this has been a very constructive debate. I'm not going to appoint a winner, but the real winner is the audience because I think you've hopefully learned something new. So please join me in thanking our debater tonight, Ben Shapiro and Cenk Uger. And give a round of applause for Politicon. Give a round of applause for you. My name is Stephen Olicaro with the Millennial Action Project. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you.